Uh, our guest in this first segment is Nate Kane. Nate is a candidate for Congress, the seat currently held by Alex Mooney. Uh, Alex Mooney, of course, running for U.S. Senate. Nate, good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me. Nate, when you go on radio interview programs like this or TV shows, do you turn your cell phone off? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> you see, it's a very human mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. But if you get caught, John, it's, it's still embarrassing. It, it can be uh, My brutal. pay will be docked. It can be brutal. Nate, uh, you've got quite the history, quite the career, and quite the story to tell here. We've had you on the program before, but uh, for our audience members who are new and are just learning about you for the first time today, give us the Reader's Digest version of the Nate Kane story. Well, <laughs> Reader's Digest version, that's a tough one, but uh, I'll do my best. So... Um, in 2017, 2018, I was embroiled in a whistleblowing uh, situation. Uh, I was working for the FBI. I had a, a career of 26 years as, in cybersecurity, and I ended up blowing the whistle on uh, the FBI's cover-up of Uranium One and several other matters related to uh, the Clinton Foundation and uh, Clinton Global Initiative. Uh, particularly, they were investigating all sorts of crimes, including money laundering, securities and exchange fraud, um, public corruption, and terrorism financing, and they covered all of that up. And so I, uh, I took that information, 458 pages of classified documents out of the FBI. I took them to the IG's office and to both the House and the Senate Intelligence Committees and uh, was thanked for my service to my country by being raided by the FBI several months later. And uh, so it was a, quite a trial. Um, but um, ultimately, I walked out of it uh, unscathed, uh, with uh, not a not even a ding on my uh, security clearance, and uh, and I had my, um, you know, I was of course I was never prosecuted or or indicted for anything because I didn't violate any rules. But uh, it was a very tough time. It was a very difficult decision to make, and ultimately, um, the only fruit that came out of it was. Um, eventually, when uh, after they they raided my home and and uh, my case kind of became public, I was able to talk about you know these great injustices and this two tiered system of justice that we we currently live under. And uh, so uh, I moved here to West Virginia two and a half years ago, and had no intentions of running for office. But um, after this last election in, in November, and seeing some of the things that uh, you know were still happening. Uh, you know, in our, our government, I decided it's time to, you know, try to get back in there and do something uh, to change this from the inside. And so uh, so that's when I decided to go ahead and, and put my my name in the race. Thank you, Nate. That's, uh, there's a lot of story to tell there, and I appreciate the fact that you were able to kind of encapsulate that in about a minute and a half, but there's certainly a lot to unpack there. Let's go to Bill Stubblefield first, Admiral. Yeah, good morning, Nate. And I'm, I'm, I'm with Rob. I, there's a lot of questions I uh, that, that I would like to ask. First thing is, uh, uh, you said you carried the evidence to the IG. Uh, why was that necessary? The IG that I'm familiar with are very, very aggressive. All you have to do is just float an idea in front of them, and they start digging. You would not have to carry the evidence to them. Uh, what made this different? Well, what made this difference was uh, pretty much everybody that was in my complaint um, for the uh, – everybody in, in the complaint was in my chain of command. So it was, um, of course, uh, Comey. Uh, it was also the ICIG, who typically, if that's who I would have gone to normally, um, is uh, Michael Atkinson, who was the intelligence community uh, inspector general. He was the head of the public corruption unit at the time that – the information that I was bringing um, uh, was about, which was the you know surrounding the Scythius committee, and and also um, Robert Mueller was also uh, involved as well because he was the FBI director. So I mean, I at first I didn't go initially to the IG. I didn't know that I could trust any of the IGs, and so under the law, I was afforded the opportunity to bring information directly to uh, any of the intelligence committees, and they were investigating. Uh, the issue of Uranium One. <clears throat> this was uh, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. So I brought information directly to them, 
They asked me then to go back in to get more information, which reluctantly I did. Um, and I did it on my last day because I only had a week left. I knew as soon as I blew the whistle, I did not want to be there anymore. And uh, so when I went back in to go get more information, they would give me a means of contacting them, but I got cut off. So at that point, I had to go hire an attorney, a uh, whistleblowing attorney, and then figure out, you know, what to do next. And so I had a classified thumb drive, essentially, and I contacted an attorney, and he helped me to navigate that process. Uh, we have ultimately decided to go through uh, the DOJ IG, and, uh, and, and actually Horowitz turned out to be an upstanding man who actually uh, helped me to um, not only help me to give a credibility rating because Jeff Sessions would not, uh, because he had recused himself from all things Hillary Clinton. And so he ultimately had to make a credibility rating, and he did determine that the information was credible and that it was of a national uh, security urgent concern, and then gave me authorizations to take the additional information uh, to both the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and the Senate Select Committee. But then when I brought, when my lawyer contacted them to bring that information, both those committees wouldn't take the information from me because I was unwilling to give my name. I had authorization to use a code name, uh, MC Poda, and to keep my identity hidden, but uh, they didn't want to take the information from me. So basically what ended up happening was we went back to him and uh, and uh, Horowitz uh, asked if he brought the information to them, if they would accept it. So we asked them, and they said yes. So he had his deputy hand deliver the information to both committees. That's how important he felt this was to get out to them. John Gilstrap. So the end of the story. I, I, I wager that if we went out to the town square somewhere and asked 25 people, uh, what did you think about the Uranium One issue, you'd get 24 puppy dog stares coming back at you. So after, after all of the sacrifice and the danger, and what came of it? Um, well, nothing, because, you know, this process of going through the whistleblowing process uh, through the traditional means took so long. Um, to finally, you know, get everything arranged and get everything done. And then things even got delayed once it got into the process. There's supposed to be a 21-day period, but it got delayed for a couple of months because of uh, Jeff Sessions uh, refusing to give it a hearing or give it a credibility rating. He wouldn't even look at the documents. So that delayed everything, and it took almost a year for me to get through it. And by that time, I think we were only a few months away before a change of the uh, the Congress uh, changing over to being under Democrat control. And so uh, Adam Schiff, who ended up uh, taking over as chairman of the um, of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, uh, decided to do nothing. And then, of course, uh, in the Senate, um, we found out several months later that the Senate never even received the documents. They got the documents, but whoever their liaison was, shoved it into a drawer and so it was not you know was not even looked at it wasn't until i was experiencing um harassment from an fbi uh, uh, uh agent and, uh, and they ended up you know i ended up going and reporting that uh to to the uh, chairman of the judiciary on the senate uh, which had just been uh, recently named as um as lindsey graham and his uh, investigative counsel met with me and my lawyer. Uh, we went over all that information, and it was during that time we discovered, you know, when we started looking into things, that the Senate uh, Intelligence Committee never even received the documents. So clearly there are some major problems with, with the whistleblowing process, and, uh, and it's something that, that definitely needs to be uh, corrected. But, uh, yeah, nothing happened, and, uh, and eventually, you know, it just kind of, faded off into obscurity. And so the only thing that ended up happening, the only person who was who was damaged in any of this, the only person who had any kind of uh, uh, repercussions was me. Nate, uh, can I, curious I think John still had a follow-up there. Sorry, have... No, I just, I, what you're talking about, it's, it kind of resonates with some of the things we were talking about in the studio here before the, the show started, and that there's this great sense of 
I perceive a great sense of anger in the country that manifests itself in a number of ways with a lot of violence and shootings and, and, and that sort of thing. And what what you're talking about here is is a case of the left protecting the left and it goes the other way too. the right protects the right, which adds to this this sense of division and anger among people. Now, you've declared the uh, candidacy for the Congress. How do you how do you put this genie back in the bottle? What are, what are you willing to do, or what is a strategy to to stop it? To find to find to concentrate on justice instead of concentrating on team play to make sure one side looks better than the other. Well, I think that one of the problems that we have right now is that um, we do have a, a problem with the judiciary. It's not just within the executive. Pro- you know, we there there are problems all the way around. And I don't, you know, I think everybody knows that the FBI is never going to investigate themselves, that the Department of Justice is never going to indict themselves. And this is exactly why uh, I think the Constitution affords the right of Congress to um, formulate an Article I tribunal, uh, which is essentially a a court uh, that's specifically set up by Congress. Uh, Congress has the right to appoint the judges. Uh, and the point of this would be to adjudicate agency issues. And so um, I think the last time I was on, I was asked if this is, you know, have ever been done before. And at the time, I was still, you know, looking into it. It was still a fairly new idea, but I've done a lot more research since then. And we already have one of these courts that does exist. It's, it's the U.S. Tax Court. It falls under Article One. What's unique about it is that the, the Congress actually get to appoint these judges, and th- these judges, they don't have to be somebody that's within the judiciary uh, system right now. They can appoint anybody as a judge, as long as somebody is, you know, of, of good moral character, of sound mind, has a you know good understanding of, of the law and reason, and and they clearly need to be somebody that is not tainted or is not uh, corrupt. But these judges are are not lifetime appointments; they are are temporary, and the Congress can reduce the salaries down to zero to effectively shut down the court when it's done its job. And I do think that that would be something that I would want to see because I I don't want to see, you know, the growth of federal government. I think that we've got too big a federal government already. But in this case, I think we need a a uh, need this sort of a court in order to adjudicate not only these issues of of abuses of power towards whistleblowers, but also when you look at the abuses that have happened uh, that have been revealed through the Twitter files. I mean, it's it's enormous. You're talking millions of dollars paid to Twitter in order to censor the American people, in order to shut down accounts. And as we found out in the last interview between Tucker Carlson and um, uh, between Tucker Carlson and Elon Musk, they are also spying on us through these relationships with big tech. And so. Tucker Carlson had asked, you know, do they, because Elon Musk had said that when he went in there, that he saw that the government basically had total, you know, total control within uh, Twitter. And he said, do they have access even to our DMs, you know, which are, of course, direct messages. These are supposed to be private messages uh, that are between people. And he said, yes. So this is something that Twitter is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I know for a fact that this kind of thing is also going on with other uh, big tech corporations. And the reason I know is because I was once um, read on to several programs uh, at uh, NSA. And this was a a huge uh, concern that I had back then. But back then, there were certain um, unmasking procedures that were required that were removed in Obama's last month in office. And so uh, I don't believe that the protections are there anymore to protect the American people against their constitutional rights being violated. And so these are things that I do believe that have to be adjudicated. Because when you think about there's a system of surveillance now that is so powerful and so widespread and so abused with really nobody keeping an eye on this because it's all hidden under that cloak of classification. You know, how many judges are being spied on? How many congressmen are being spied on? And if that is happening, then that means that you've got essentially people who could be blackmailed. And uh, and that is a very dangerous thing. I think we're in a very dangerous place, and I think it needs to be uh, adjudicated and dealt with. 
And, uh, you know, and there's, there is a, a current federal law right now, which I think is what, what needs to be used against those people who have abused this system, and that is deprivation of rights under color of law. The reason I think that law is important is because it has very, very high penalties, all the way up to life in prison. And in the case of if a, somebody's rights were deprived, uh, in the case of, uh, you know, and it caused a, a death, I think, uh, you know, you know, you got some examples of this uh, that we're beginning to find out in relation to COVID and some of the things that were, you know, pushed by government officials when they knew that there was evidence out there, you know, of, of certain dangers that were in place. And yet they went ahead and they pushed forward with this stuff anyways. Um, you know, this that law includes even the death penalty. And so I think these things are, are all on the table and I think they need to be. Uh, invoked by Congress, but I, I like I said, because this system has been in place for some time, the surveillance system, we don't know what judges have been compromised and which ones haven't. Nate Kane is so our I, uh, hey, Nate, concern. I don't, before we run out of time, I want to move on to some other topics too, because sure. uh, the next congressional class and the one after that and the one after that, and, and usually if you get elected to Congress, you don't get out in two years, you're usually there for a while. Uh, but they're going to have to deal with some serious financial issues. And I'm not just talking about the debt. I'm talking about yeah. Social Security, uh, Medicare. These are all things that are projected to have deficit balances in the very near future if we don't do something about uh, these two gigantic programs uh, to start. Uh, the next congressional class is going to have to deal with this in a more frank and earnest manner. Uh, what are your thoughts on these things and what is your plan? Well, I, I just posted something on this this morning on my social media. You know, uh, Janet Yellen, uh, Secretary of the Treasury, just came out and said that um, that she thinks that that they may have to go to some sort of extreme measure of um, uh, you know making the the um, debt ceiling unconstitutional. Well, you know, I got news for her. Uh, she doesn't have a right to do that, and certainly the executive branch does not have a right to do that. Um, the Power of the purses is, is one of the most important powers that Congress has, and they need to use it. The fact is, is we've got out of control spending going on, and things like Social Security that that is money that people have paid into the system, and so that is not even on the table and should not be on the table for discussion in terms of cuts. However, there are things that absolutely should be cut. When we look at the kind of spending that has gone on, things like. Just look at what, how much money have we spent, uh, you know, in, in sending money and, suppl and supplies, you know, uh, to, you know, this uh, war over in the Ukraine. And, and what good has that done? We found out that there was, uh, in some audits that were done, that money was being used. Uh, there was hundreds of millions of dollars that was unaccounted for, and that money was being used in things that were, um, you know, like for people to buy luxury homes and luxury cars and vacations. I mean, it's ridiculous, uh, that kind of frivolous spending. But there's also other major areas of, of the federal government, I think, honestly, need to be cut. You know, and when we look at, uh, quite frankly, some of these surveillance programs that are being used on American people, um, whenever Congress is asking for oversight and they're not being given it, immediately it should be followed with, okay, then you're not going to get another dime from the American people, because our tax dollars should come with oversight. And if it's not be if they're not being cooperated with and being given oversight, I think they need to make cuts. And I think that uh, there's plenty of places that we can be making cuts. There's a lot of agencies that the states uh, absolutely can do the job, and I don't understand why we even have federal agencies, uh, you know, that that deal with some of the stuff. They certainly shouldn't have any say over some of the things that are going on in the states. The enumerated powers are very clear about what the federal government should be doing, and anything that's not listed there, it should be to the states to do, not the federal government. And so the biggest area of cut, cuts, as far as I'm concerned, is they need to cut some of these federal agencies that, that really shouldn't, shouldn't even exist. Would you give examples, Nate? Uh, sure. Uh, how, let's start with uh, you know alcohol, uh, tobacco, and firearms. Why does that agency even exist? I mean, when you look at right now, uh, in, when you look at the states, the states have the right to determine, you know, those issues for their states. The federal government should not. Uh, the fact that the ATF can come out and say, hey, 
uh, you know, we're going to we're going to ban this gun because it has a wrist strap. That is uh, that's a violation number one of the Second Amendment uh, when it says that shall not infringe. I don't see how the federal government has the right to make those types of decisions. But again, even if a state wanted to make that right, fine, leave it to the states. Why does the federal government have a say in it? Why do they have a say in tobacco purchases or uh, you know or alcohol? Uh, to me, ATF. Alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, that sounds more like a convenience store than a government agency. So those are that's one example. Uh, the EPA is another example. Uh, I see no reason at all why the federal government should be involved in telling a state uh, you know, what they should be doing in terms of rules. Any of these agencies that actually are writing rules where you can actually be fined or put in jail, uh, again, this stands to the whole thing of, you know, Congress – are the elected they're the elected people who should be actually writing legislation not bureaucrats and so any any agency uh that is writing legislation or, or creating rules i think those powers need to go back to the uh congress and if congress is unwilling to uh to do them or if it's too much for them well then maybe that's a perfect example of something that doesn't belong in the federal government but the resource conservation and recovery act was an act of congress that established the EPA. I don't know if it established the EPA, but it certainly empowered the EPA. Sure. And I, and I think that, that, you know, I think Congress makes mistakes at times, and some of these things need to be righted. Nate Kane has been our guest this half hour. Final question for Nate, Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, you're running on the, as an American First candidate. Is that correct, Nate? That's correct. Okay. And uh, you're, you're new to the area. You're not well known. Uh how are you going to make a dent in, uh, uh, for public awareness of how people get to know you? Well, I'm getting out there, and I'm meeting the people. And I'll tell you, I, I, uh, this last month I, I spoke in 18 counties. And, uh, and so I'm getting out there. I've probably spoken to you know, close to two or 3,000 people already, and, uh, and I have no intention of slowing down. And so that means that you know, whether it's uh, GOP committee meetings or whether it is uh, various clubs that I'm meeting at, uh, churches and, and other places, I'm going out there and meeting the people in every county of the you know, 27 counties in the 2nd District. Uh, also, the other thing that we're doing is, uh, as I've kind of established some you know, relationships with various people, then I'm beginning to put together uh, town hall-style events to where you know, we can bring more people to them. So that's, that's the primary way is getting out there. Really, it's a, it is a grassroots effort. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, I will tell you, this is the most exhausting work I've ever done for no pay. <laughs> and, uh, but I am getting out there and uh, and speaking to the people and and getting in front of them. And, and Nate, uh, by the way, uh, did it cost you financially to be a whistleblower out of your own pocket in terms of legal fees and such? Uh, yes, it did. Uh, my my legal fees uh, came to one hundred ninety eight thousand dollars. And um, if it had not been for uh, a, there was a woman in in, um, in Nashville uh, who donated uh, a wrote a check to my attorney to cover my entire legal fees. Uh, I would not. I probably wouldn't be standing here talking to you. Would you do it again? And would you recommend it to others? I would do it again. And the only thing that I can say in terms of recommending to others, I made my choice to do that after much prayer and consideration, and I felt the Lord had put me there in that position at that time to come across that information. So I knew that someday I'd stand before my maker, and I certainly did not want to you know, have him say, hey, son, you know, I put you there. Why didn't you do something about it? I think this decision is something that people have to make for themselves. I would never hold it against somebody who decided you know, to keep their mouth shut because you know they got a family to feed. Um, but it took a lot of faith, and it took a lot of um, courage to do it, but I couldn't have had that courage without the knowledge that I was doing the right thing in, in God's eyes. And so I don't hold it against people. There's a lot of people that say, well, why aren't there more people you know, out there blowing the whistle? Because it's costly, because they can come after you. They can you know, try to destroy your life. I, I get that. And uh, so... You know, as far, as far as people, whether I would recommend whether they do it, the one thing I will say is I think it's a, um, if you are going to do something, is make sure that you do everything you can to find out what the law says and stay within the bounds of the law. 
is once you step outside of that, you become a, a Snowden, uh, you know, or this other kid who just recently leaked a lot of information. It, it puts you in jeopardy, and, and then you're going to go to jail. And that's certainly not something that I wanted to do. So I think we all have to make our own decisions as to what we, you know, what we can or cannot do. But um, ultimately, we've got to make those decisions, I think, uh, and, and stand before our maker someday you know, for what we do. Nate, thank you very much. I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you.